بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد دي برادر سيسترز إن إسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we will start to study a beautiful hadith that illustrates the mercy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and we can learn from it some of the rulings of our beautiful religion, the religion of Allah. The hadith was reported in Sahih al-Imam Muslim and other books as well. So it is as high as it can be in levels of authenticity. The, hab the hadith was narrated by Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam. May Allah be pleased with him. He says that while I was praying with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so it was congregational prayer, a man in the company sneezed. I said, Allah have mercy on you. In Arabic, yarhamkumullah. And this is what we usually say when someone sneezes and praises Allah the Almighty. The people stared at me with disapproving looks. So I said, woe be upon me. Why is it that you are staring at me? They began to strike their hands on their thighs. And when I saw them urging me to observe silence, I said nothing. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give, uh, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said the prayer, for whom I would give my father and mother as ransom, I have never seen neither before him nor after him, a teacher who gave better instruction than him. I swear that he did not scold me. He did not beat me or swore at me. He merely said, talking to persons is not fitting during the prayer, for it consists of glorifying Allah declaring his greatness and recitation of the Qur'an or words to that effect. I said, O Prophet of Allah, I was till recently a pagan, but Allah has brought Islam to us. Among us, there are men who resort to kahin, that is, fortune tellers or soothsayers. He said, do not go to them. I said, there are men who take omens. They believe in bad omens. That is something, the Prophet said, which they find in their chests, but let it not turn their way from freedom of action. I said, among us, there are men who draw lines. He said, there was a Prophet who drew lines, so if their lines coincide with his lines, so be it. And there is another paragraph to complete this hadith, but we will not have time to comment on it. So I will leave it, inshallah, to uh, the next time we meet. In this beautiful hadith, Muawiyah is telling us, may Allah be pleased with him, about an incident that could happen in any masjid where someone did something by mistake. And this thing that Muawiyah did was known in Islam as a tashmeet. And this is in response to a person who sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah. And this is part of the etiquette of Islam. Islam is based on your connection with Allah the Almighty. We remember Allah every single time, every single breath, with every single step. We always 
remember Allah Azza wa Jal because we know it is our conviction that our, de our existence is dependent on Him, the Almighty. In His hands lie our souls and fate. So Islam is built on remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. I do not know any other religion that does this. Every single thing you do, you mention the name of Allah. No one else. You don't mention the names of priests or messengers or prophets. Unless the prophet tells us that Allah told us to do so. So we have what is known as adhkar, supplications. We have a whole set of them to say in the morning and to say in the evening. We say them before we go to bed. So it's a religious ritual that we do every single night. We say certain sets of supplications or adhkar after every mandatory prayer. Not only that, before we eat, we say Bismillah. After we conclude eating, we praise Allah the Almighty with certain supplications. If we want to go to bed, we say certain supplications. When we wake up immediately, we say these supplications. Before entering the lavatories and after exiting. Before entering the masjid and after exiting. Before leaving the house. When you ride on your car, in your car, or on your horse, or your ride, or whatever. There is a certain dhikr you say. Even before having intimacy with your spouse, there is a dhikr that you praise Allah Azza wa Jal and you say it. So everything we do in our lives is connected to Allah the Almighty. And this shows you the strength and the amount of conviction Muslims have that they attribute all goodness to the Almighty Allah in everything they do. Unlike those who worship Allah only on Friday or on a Saturday or on a Sunday and then they neglect Him. They turn their backs to Him without paying any attention. Muslims are not like that. Muslims are God-fearing people. It's always on their conscience because they remember Allah Azza wa Jal 24-7. So it is like what psychiatrists may call stereotyping, but it is a positive stereotyping. It is filling your heart with goodness and with the love of Allah Azza wa Jal by acknowledging His beautiful names and attributes. So one of these supplications is connected with sneezing. And one will say, why sneezing? What's so special about sneezing? Doctors from long time ago used to say that sneezing is something that is beneficial to the human body. And they have explanations I cannot understand or relate to. But they say it's a sign of health unless it comes with cold. But if someone sneezes due to allergy, due to any other reason other than sickness and illness, it's a, a sign of uh, being healthy. And we're also told in the hadith that Allah Azza wa Jal loves sneezing. And Allah Azza wa Jal hates yawning. Yawning is loved by shaitan, by the devil, because it's a sign of fatigue. It's a sign of laziness. It's a sign of wanting to sleep, which may not make you a person, uh, an active person. So a person who always sleepy and drowsy is not going to be active in doing good things neither in this life or for his hereafter in terms of forms of worship. Allah loves sneezing. And why is that? Because it's a ritual in Islam. It is the right of, of, of every Muslim. It's the right of every Muslim if you hear him sneeze and he praises Allah Azza wa Jal, you must and you're obliged to say to him, 
And then he would reply to you by saying, يَهْدِيكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيُصْلِحُ بَالَكُمْ So this exchange of praising Allah Azza wa Jal and invocation is loved by Allah. Every time someone sneezes, says, Alhamdulillah. Anyone who hears him, it becomes mandatory upon each and every individual to say, Yarhamukumullah. Of course, unless there is some sort of fitna. So if a person hears a woman saying, Alhamdulillah, and there, are, there is no one else with them, and he says, Yarhamukumullah, this is inappropriate. One should refrain. He should say it in his heart because shaitan may build on such an exchange of praising of Allah Azza wa Jal. And fitna must be avoided. But generally speaking, this is hypothetical. However, you should not say, Yarhamukumullah, may Allah have mercy upon you, unless you hear that individual saying, Alhamdulillah. Why? Because two men once sneezed in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. One of them said, Alhamdulillah. So the Prophet ﷺ replied to him by saying, Yarhamukumullah. May Allah Azza wa Jal have mercy on you. And coming from the Prophet ﷺ, Allah will answer this for sure. The other one, the Prophet did not say anything to him. So he objected. O Prophet of Allah, we both sneezed in your presence. But you prayed for that person and you did not pray for me. Why is that? So the Prophet said to him, because he praised Allah and you didn't. And in a hadith that was also reported in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, the Prophet said, والسلام, whoever sneezes and praises Allah Azza wa Jal, then you should do the act of tashmeet, saying, Yarhamukumullah. And whoever does not praise Allah Azza wa Jal, do not say that to him. And this, by the way, should only be said to a Muslim. Because we know as Muslims, we may ask Allah for anything good for non-Muslims in this life. So if there is a non-Muslim, a friend, a colleague, or, or a relative, and I go to visit him and he's sick, I may say, may Allah cure you. May Allah heal your illness. If he's indebted, may Allah pay off your debt and grant you money. If he is blessed with a child, may Allah make your child blessed. May Allah guide him. This is totally permissible and it is part of our religion to be nice to others. However, when it comes to asking for forgiveness, or for the mercy of the disbelievers, this is prohibited by Quran. And Allah Azza wa Jal forbade his messenger Ibrahim from seeking forgiveness for his father, Azar, who died as a mushrik. And likewise, the Prophet was prohibited from seeking forgiveness for his mother. And the hadith is a Sahih Muslim. So we have to abide by the rules and regulations. We have to stick to the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal. Therefore, we cannot say to someone who is a kafir, may Allah forgive you. May Allah have mercy on you. This is prohibited. This is something between him and Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal would hold him accountable and we're restricted from saying such a, such a thing. This is why, why the Jews used to sneeze in the presence of the Prophet والسلام, trying to make him slip and say to them, may Allah have mercy on you. But the Prophet would not say anything except, may Allah guide you. Allah wa yusliḥu balakum. May Allah, the Almighty, guide you. And this is permissible. There's nothing wrong in that. So the etiquette of sneezing and answering is something beloved to uh, Allah the Almighty. In the hadith, Muawiyah said, Yarhamkumullah to the man next to him who sneezed. And most likely, the man said, Alhamdulillah. But no one 
said anything to the man who sneezed and said Alhamdulillah. Why is that? Because Alhamdulillah is part of the things said in the Salat, in your prayer. So it is not something outside of the prayer. Unlike Yarhamukumullah, this is a form or a phrase that you're addressing someone else. So it is not in line with the Salat. It's not in line with the prayer. While praising Allah Azza wa by saying Alhamdulillah is definitely in line with the prayer. When Muawiyah did what he had done, the Prophet did not tell him والسلام, to repeat the Salat. However, the consensus of scholars is that whoever speaks in the prayer with phrases or sentences that are not part of the prayer, then his prayer is invalid. This is the consensus. But they made an exception. That they say that with the exception of someone who does it by mistake, he's unaware of it, or due to ignorance. And how would a person be ignorant with such a thing? In the case of Muawiyah, it's very logical and understood. At the beginning of time, when the prayer was first mandated, they were not prohibited from speaking and talking within the prayer itself. As in the authentic hadith, the companions used to stand in prayer, but greet one another while they are in the congregational prayer. So they would say, how are you? How is the family? How is this? How is that? And then go back to the prayer, listening to the imam or if it's a silent prayer. This was common and accepted until it was abrogated. When Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the ayah, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ So stand in silence to Allah Azza wa Jal. And since then, speaking was totally prohibited in prayer. However, scholars say that if someone does it by mistake, unintentionally, so someone probably is in the midst of his prayer, he's contemplating, and all of a sudden, and this happens, a man comes into the masjid and as loud as he can, shouts in the masjid, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This person was so involved in prayer, he was startled by the salam. So without him feeling or knowing, he replied by saying, Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. After the prayer was over, he said, Akhi, what have you done? He said, Wallahi, I did not even notice that. I, I, I just spoke without thinking. And by Allah, I did not intend it. So do we say, repeat your prayer? The answer is no. His, repair, his prayer is valid and correct because it was done by mistake. Allah says in the Quran, Rabbana la tu'akhidhna in nasina aw akhta'na. Oh Allah, don't hold us accountable if we make, uh, uh, if we forget or make a mistake. In Sahih Imam Muslim, Allah replied to them by saying, I have done so, meaning I have forgiven you. So it's the grace of Allah the Almighty that he pardons us if we were to make something out of mistake or out of ignorance. And in the case of Muawiyah, it was surely out of ignorance. He did not know that it was not permissible. Otherwise, he would not have done it. In the hadith, he said that the people, when he said, Yarhamukumullah, he tells us that the people started looking at him. Now, this would be a little bit strange. Definitely the people at the back, at the front, would not be able to look behind them because this would nullify their prayer. It was the people to his side and probably he felt the heat of their looks from behind him because those beside him might have looked to the side. So he was saying, woe be to, be, to me or be upon me. Why are you staring at me like this? So he didn't even notice that they were angry of him talking because he didn't think that he did something wrong. 
So he started talking to him. Well, why are you staring at me? Look at the hand. Who are you talking to? So subhanAllah, they did not know what to do except striking their hands on their thighs. So it's like clapping, but you're striking your thighs. And he noticed that all of them are doing this. So he understood that they want him to simply shut up. And so this was what he had done. Now, the prayer was over. And then the mercy of the Prophet والسلام, is illustrated. He himself says that I am ready to give my father and my mother as ransom for the Prophet And this is an Arabic expression because if you were told the Prophet is, rans is, is a hostage and they want ransom for him, what are you willing to pay? the most valuable thing in your life is not your wealth. It's your parents. So it's an Arabic expression to say to someone that you love, I am willing to give my father and mother as a ransom for him. Not that it's required, but this shows you how important he is in their lives. So he says, by Allah, I'm ready to sacrifice my family for the Prophet ﷺ. He did not scold me. He did not beat me and he did not swear at me or curse me. And usually this is the doing of tyrants. This is the doing of hard teachers or teachers who do not know how to upbring and raise generations. So if you have a teacher like that, <clears throat> you are in trouble. A teacher that does not speak to you or with you without slapping your face or uh, 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 spanking you with a stick or at least ridiculing whatever you say. There are such teachers. Whenever you speak, they make fun of you. Even if your question is legitimate, they make fun of you and of what you are saying so that next time you do not even ask or you would not even have the guts to stand up and answer a question. The Prophet ﷺ was totally unlike this. Though what Muawiyah had done was a grave mistake. And we would not say that it's a sin because he didn't know. But it was something that was unacceptable. All of a sudden, in the middle of a prayer where everyone is concentrating on their prayers, you speak loudly like this and say, why are you looking at me like this? So the normal reaction would have been few words of reprimandment, reprimanding him. But this, even that, did not come from the Prophet ﷺ. On the contrary, the Prophet ﷺ told him that this prayer of Allah ﷺ, nothing of man's talk is suitable in it. It's only praising Allah, glorifying Allah, saying takbir and reciting the Qur'an. This captivated the heart of Muawiyah, the way that the Prophet spoke to him, والسلام, the way that the Prophet taught him. Because Muawiyah was not one of the close companions of the Prophet. والسلام, had he been one of those close companions, he would have known the ruling of speaking while in prayer. But he was someone who just came in, like any other Muslim. Yet the Prophet ﷺ went out of his way to explain to this person the essence of Salat, which made him narrate this hadith on and on and on to generations until it reached us and it gave us a glimpse of the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was sent as mercy for mankind. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. The lines are open for your questions if you have any. Uh, we have a question from uh, Farhan. He's saying that his parents opened an account without his knowledge, a saving account in his native country, and they told him that it was a current account. So there were no uh, interest to be deposited in it. But after a while, he discovered that they either made a mistake or lied to him. It was a saving account, and the interest was pouring in to that account. He says, am I sinful for that? The answer is, if you had no say in it, no, you're not sinful. Second question, can he use the account in order to register for PayPal or to buy something from Amazon without using the account? The answer is yes, inshallah, there's nothing wrong in that. If you have full control over that account, you must see and calculate the interest, take it out and cleanse your wealth by spending it in uh, means of charity without intending the reward from Allah because there is no reward in uh, uh, money that is earned through haram. You simply want to cleanse your wealth from it, and Allah knows best. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Sheikh, I have five questions. Ya Latif. My first question is regarding ajwa alia dates and consumption of water after that. I would like, uh, according to an authentic hadith, if we eat five ajwa dates, uh, seven ajwa dates and do not drink water after that on empty stomach, we will be protected from poison on that day. I would like to know how long do we have to refrain from drinking from water uh, to get this protection? Okay. Uh, and my second question is regarding interest-based debt and Hajj. I maxed out one of my credit cards a long time ago and accumulated some uh, interest-based debt. Now I'm planning to perform Hajj this year. Do I have to pay this debt in full before going to Hajj? Are you paying it, Akhi? Muhammad, are you paying it and in installments? No, I stopped the payments long time ago. It's been like 12 years now. Okay. And uh, thirdly, I would like to know, uh, is it permissible to pay emphatic sunnah uh, uh, after paying the Hayatul Masjid before Fajr congregation. Okay. And uh, is bodybuilding allowed in Islam? Just uh, weightlifting or even with steroids and anabolic steroids? No steroids, just weightlifting and muscle building. Okay. And uh, my last question is regarding evening askar. When is the best time to say evening askar? Is it after Asr or after Maghrib? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Thank you. You're quite welcome, Akhi. Uh, Brother Muhammad from Saudi Arabia is asking five questions. The first question is regarding the, um, the ajwa dates and the hadith of the Prophet, والسلام, whoever eats early in the morning seven ajwa dates, then on that day, he would not be harmed by neither poison nor uh, a spell, meaning magic or black magic. And the hadith is authentic. However, I do not know anything related to drinking water. And I'm trying to look in some of um, uh, the hadith references, whether you should not drink any water afterwards. And I could not see that. So to my knowledge, this is not authentic. The authentic thing is that the first thing you do after waking up is consuming these uh, seven dates. But if you eat them and then drink water afterwards, there's nothing wrong in that. If you have your breakfast, then eat them. This it does not work. You have to eat them on an empty stomach. But after eating them, you can drink, inshallah. His second question, that he has a debt that he did not pay, and it's interest-based. His reasons for not paying it is beyond me, but this is something that he has to be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. Though it is riba-based, the capital which you have borrowed from them, you must return it to them. The interest is an issue of dispute and depending whether you can 
uh, uh, evade it, uh, uh, escape it or not. But you have to pay the money to the, uh, uh, the lawful owners of that uh, money. But does this conflict with his hajj? As long as you can find money to go for hajj, you can go and perform hajj. There's no problem in that. This debt does not affect your hajj. Your hajj, your hajj is valid. But you, this is a sin that you will be uh, uh, accountable for. Aisha from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Samtullah. Uh, my question, Sheikh, is regarding the uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam parents. Okay. Uh, it seems. Uh, wait. It seems what? I like when uh, Islam came, right? Okay. Hello? Yes. Uh -huh. So, uh, what are their position in Islam? Are they Muslim, uh, Muslims or... Okay. Or not? I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, thank you. Um, Muhammad's third question, he says that, are we allowed to offer Sunnah al-Fajr after Tahiyyatul Masjid in Fajr time? Akhi, there is a hadith which was reported in the Sunan. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, forbade praying between Adhan and Iqama of Fajr except the two rak'ahs of Sunnah, which is known as Raghibatul Fajr or Sunnatul Fajr. However, if a person enters the Masjid after the Adhan and he did not pray it, he must pray these two rak'ahs of sunnah and nothing else. What about the greeting of the masjid, the two rak'ahs of tahiyyat al-masjid? Well, these two rak'ahs are embedded in the two rak'ahs of sunnah. Why? Because the Prophet did not, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell us to pray a specific or individual prayer for greeting the masjid. He said that whenever any of you enter a masjid, he must not sit until he prays two rak'ahs. That's it. So if I pr enter the masjid while they're praying fard, and I pray with them, this suffices. If I enter the masjid and I pray two rak'ahs of Sunnah al-Fajr, this suffices. But if I, uh, I'm, I'm at my home and the adhan is called, and I pray two rak'ahs of Sunnah al-Fajr in my home as the Sunnah is, and I walk to the masjid and I enter the masjid and the iqamah is not given, I cannot sit. Therefore, I have to pray two rak'ahs of sunnah, al sunnah al-masjid or tahiyyat al-masjid. I have prayed sunnah al-fajr in my home. This is why it's permissible now to do it. But to combine both separately, meaning praying tahiyyat al-masjid, then sunnah al-fajr in the masjid, this is not permissible. Uh, Tolra from the Emirates. Tolra. Tolra from the Emirates. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Sheikh. Good afternoon. Yeah, please, I have a question. Uh, I want to ask because um, I'm non-Arabic, so okay. I'm reading the Quran in Russian. So I want to ask if the reward is the same or less. Can you read Arabic? I can't. I don't speak and I can't read. Okay. But I'm living in UAE and I'm reading the Quran in Russian only. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Please, thank you so much. Uh, Salah from Qatar. Hello? Yes, Salah. Assalamu alaikum. Salam to Allah. I am the clergyman in the Saudi, in the Saudi Arabia, and our government ordered the execution of the Sheikh Nimr. What is the difference between you and the Nimr? We all are Muslim, in, uh, and, and the Prophet said, Man lam yahtamma bumur al Muslim in falaytal Muslim. I seriously want you to protest to this. Salah. Salah, I want to ask you a question, a simple question. What do you think of Mother Aisha, the wife of the Prophet والسلام, And what do you think of Abu Bakr and of Umar and of Uthman and the rest of the companions of the Prophet والسلام? Are they Muslims? Will they be with the Prophet in Jannah? What do you think of them? Okay, uh, Salah probably made a statement and I will answer his question, inshallah. Aliya from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I have two questions. Yes. Can my mother give the things to 
my father uh, of my father to the needy ones without his permission permission as he is not using it and my second question is check when we offer salah if we forgot surah suppose i am reading big surah after surah uh, surah fatiha in first rakat if i forgot that surah can i read another surah okay i will answer you inshallah okay allah hafiz allah عبد الفتاح فروم عراق السلام عليكم سلام الله وبركاته I wanted to know if this is right that you got money from Saudi Arabia because which would you blah 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 again <laughs> والله يا أخي you are making me laugh you are making me laugh because all what you say is Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia what is it with you guys what's the problem what's the beef you have can't you ask questions related to the topic or at least to Ramadan or at least to Islam? Things that do with politics, you and I don't have any say in it. You don't have any say in what's happening in your country. If you can take care of your own country, that would be a great thing to do. So I يعني, beg to differ, but this is becoming a, a, a nuisance in a sense. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, Asking about bodybuilding. Akhi, you should ask about mind building with these lunatics calling every uh, five minutes. And as if they are advocating or defending their cause, they are adding fuel to the fire. And this is what they want. Bodybuilding is something permissible in Islam. To be in a state of uh, physical fitness is something encouraged in Islam. And the Prophet told us والسلام, that a strong believer is better than a weak believer. And this is in all aspects, whether uh, ma mainly it is in uh, a spiritual and religious aspect. But this doesn't also contradict with being strong in wealth, strong in knowledge, and strong in uh, uh, physics and uh, in, in the physical ability. However, if you're doing it to show off or to impress women or to boast about it, this becomes a sin. If you're doing it for self-contentment and satisfaction and just to be able to be strong and whenever the call for jihad is being given you're always there and ready and prepared then this is a good thing to do uh, Farida from Saudi Arabia I think we lost Farida um, last question of Muhammad uh, may Allah reward him is what is the proper time for evening athkar this is an issue of dispute some scholars say it should be after asr some scholars, and, and very little of them, say it should be after Dhuhr. But the main two groups are saying that it should be between, uh, after Asr or after Maghrib. Those who say after Asr, they say because they are called evening adhkar. So when the sun sets and you did not say them, then you're not protected. But, but if you say it after Asr, then you're fully protected. Others say, no, it's called evening because it's after sunset. And when you do it, then you are protected with the grace of Allah Azza wa And the time uh, uh, gap is very short, which is the Maghrib prayer. And both opinions are strong. I personally choose to say it after Maghrib most of the time. But sometimes when I have a lecture after Maghrib and I know that the time would not be sufficient for me to say, uh, say them after uh, the Salat, I say it after Asr. So Alhamdulillah, the room is there for maneuvering. Aisha from Egypt says that uh, she wants to know about the parents of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And before we go to Aisha, we have Farida again. Up to now, they don't love me. They have done many things. Farida. Should I leave them alone? Farida. I keep on with my kids. Farida, I did not hear your question. You started hitting the road running. Ah, I am saying, I was not a Muslim. My husband converted me to Islam. My I am saying, I was not a Muslim. Then my family hated me a lot. Up to now, they don't love me. They have done many, many things to me. Should I leave them alone and I keep on with my kids? Okay. Any more questions? 
That is my question, Shay. I want you to help me. Inshallah, I will answer you, Inshallah. And um, so Aisha is saying about the parents of the Prophet ﷺ, we have no knowledge of anything except what Allah tells us or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us. So we also believe that the most authentic book after the Quran is Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. We have also An Nasai, uh, uh, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, An Ibn Majah, Muwatta Imam Malik, Muslim Imam Ahmed, etc. But these two main sources of hadith are the most authentic. And to come and say that, no, this hadith is not authentic or weak, or to talk negatively about it means that we are talking negatively about everything else in uh, uh, the, the religion. Therefore, we have to accept whatever is there. And in Sahih Imam Muslim, the Prophet himself told us that his father and his mother are in hell. So do we know more than the Prophet We cannot do this. Do we wish that they are in paradise? Definitely we do. But this is not what we wish. It is what Allah had commanded and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Far Fardos or Fardosa from Somalia. Fardosa from Somalia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. I'm fine, Zakallah khair. Sheikh, my question is for Taraweeh. Hello? Yes, for Taraweeh. What my is... question is during Taraweeh, do, do you pray 11 haqqa or 21? Because some messages are different from each other. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, we have yes. Hafsa from Nigeria. Can you hear? Hafsa? Hafsa? F okay, I think we've lost Hafsa. Uh, Telra from the Emirates, she says that she reads the Quran in Russian. And this is, uh, uh, may, if I may correct you, there isn't any Quran in Russian or in English. The only Quran is in Arabic. That's the only Qur'an we have. You have a translation of the meaning of the Qur'an in other languages, which means that what you're reading is a translation. It's a human effort of translating their understanding to the Arabic Qur'an into your language. And she says she does not speak Arabic and she cannot read Arabic. So is she rewarded by... Uh, reading the translation of the meanings of the Quran in Russian and the answer is yes inshallah because Allah does not burden a soul beyond what it can bear and this is your ability so Allah rewards you as much as you're able to do but I would strongly advise you to enlist in uh, uh, schools or colleges or um, places that give Arabic lessons you are in a great blessing and favor of Allah being in the Emirates, which is a Muslim country, and you have a possibility and ability to learn Arabic more than anyone else. And this gives you an advantage over most Muslims because then you read the Quran and then understand it directly in Arabic as it was revealed, and so is for the Sunnah. So it's a little bit hard, but try your best and Allah would be with you. Noura from the Emirates. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Samtullah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I am now sitting on Idda and I want to do Ittikaf, inshallah. So I want to know is it, if is it I can of do it at home. Uh, Noura, is it Idda for... Uh, widow. Okay, widow. okay. And you want to go for Ittikaf? Uh, uh, yeah, and I want to do. I, I want to know if uh, it is possible to do at home. Okay. And Anymore? then what time uh, started the Ida and the ending? I, I mean, what time they started of the Etikaf and the ending time? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Any more questions? And uh, No more, but I want to clarify that I am uh, staying at a home alone with my daughter. So uh, may I attend his need? I have to, two years old like that, so... And then what, the, what is the uh, things that I should avoid? You're staying with your son or your father? My son, uh, two years old. Okay. We are alone at home. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Salam. Salah from Qatar. 
he's saying something about Shia and what is the difference between Shia and why is the Saudi uh, uh, government uh, ordered the execution of Sheikh Nimr or whatever. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but I know that there was a cleric who made blasphemous statements about our Prophet ﷺ, and he went public against Mother Aisha about all the companions and he did something that went to court and the law said it's verdict. So what's wrong in that? We have courts here. So if the judge gives a verdict of flogging someone, of executing someone, this is the law. It has to be respected. It has to be followed, let alone that that infidel made a blasphemous statement. He cursed Mother Aisha. He cursed Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. And this is what the hardcore Rafidah, whether they are Ithna Ashar or Imamiya, do. If they don't do it, let them come in public and say. So you cannot say, no, we're alike, we're Muslims. We are we? Are we alike? Let us see, compare apple to apple. We believe in Al Hassan Wal Hussein to be the masters of the youth in Jannah, in paradise. Do you believe in that? So definitely. So Alhamdulillah, we do not curse any of the Al Al Bayt. Do you curse any of the Al Al Bayt? So, no, definitely. We love and believe in the wives of the Prophet to be our mothers. Do you believe in that? He said, no. Aha. Uh -huh. Why? He said, Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, they're all infidels, they're kafir, they're in hell and they're cursed. Are you crazy? These are the wives of the Prophet He said, not only that, all the companions are liars and they are, are uh, traitors and they have betrayed the Prophet except Ammar ibn Yasir, except Salman al-Farisi, except uh, four or five of them. And the rest are all in hell. Are you a Muslim? Whoever believes in such things that I have just stated is a kafir. Take it from me to the United Nations. He is a kafir. If you add insult to injury, open their biggest book, which is Al-Kafi which is like Sahih al-Bukhari to us. And it says in black and white that the book, the Quran that we, the Muslims read, is nothing related to what Allah has revealed to Jibreel. They have their own Fatima Quran. And they say that this is 70 times bigger than the Quran you have, and there is not a single letter of what you have in it. Now, one of the two, either you believe in this, then you're a full-fledged kafir and you're in hell, and we cannot say salam to you, and we cannot eat your slaughtering, whether you pray five times or 10 times or a gazillion times a day, because this is conviction, this is belief. Or you say, no, Akhi, this is a fabrication, we don't believe in this, and in this case, you have to come up in the public and say, this is a fabrication. We Shia do not believe in Al-Kafi, we do not believe in Al-Tabrasi or Al-Kalini or whatever uh, names you have, because they have said blasphemous things. In this case, we have no, no beef with you, Akhi. We have no problem with you. But to come and say, no, we are alike and we're a minority. Why are you doing this? This is blasphemy. This is kufr. To talk against Abu Bakr, Umar, who else is there to carry Islam to us other than these great companions whom the Prophet ﷺ is pleased with and died while being pleased with? And if you insult the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha and Hafsa, who else is there to protect? So, Akhi, yani, I think you, and you look like in your mid-50s or 60s, you have very few uh, or little time left. It's time to reflect and see, am I on truth or am I following the manhaj and the way of these rafidah, which is based on a vengeance and hatred? They are full of hatred to all mankind. And they are full of a vengeance, though something you and I were not involved in. But they want to avenge, they want to kill, they want to uh, hit themselves and shed uh, blood as if this is part of religion and it is not. Uh, Abdullah from Saudi Arabia. Yes, hello, I'm looking at Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Uh, my question is, uh, we know uh, they say if you have a 
slave, what you feed them with what you eat, and then uh, you clothe them with uh, what you wear. But how about uh, somebody who works for you and you pay them their monthly salary? Is it like uh, uh, like the slave? That's my question. Okay, I will answer, inshallah. And then the, I, I live in the, I mean, Jidda now. Really, I really want to study the Quran and the meaning. I don't know if there's any location in Jidda that they, that they offer that. So if you could help me with that, so I will uh, go and spend some of my time learning the Quran. And that's okay. one thing I want to ask. Got your question, inshallah. I will answer you, inshallah. I don't think we have time for more calls. Alia from Saudi Arabia. Uh, she says that can her mother give sadaqa from her father's wealth without his knowledge, something that he's not using uh, for three, four years. Can she uh, dispose of it in charity without his knowledge? The answer is no, it's his. You have to take his permission first. And she says that if a, a person while reciting a long surah forgets it, forgets an ayah, can he jump to another surah? There's nothing wrong in that, providing he says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and he as a, 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 a divider between the two so that he would not mix two surahs without any uh, uh, re uh, legitimate reason. So by separating, by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and moving to another surah, this is permissible inshallah. Farida from Saudi Arabia, she says that she's a revert and her in-laws or her parents, uh, her uh, kinship are abusing her because she's a Muslim and they're not. And they're making problems to her and uh, causing him a lot of uh, uh, trouble. So she says, do I have to still see them and connect to them? Or should I stay with my kids and lead my life in peace? The answer is, if you're talking about your in-laws, no, you don't have to see them. And if you don't see them at all, you're not sinful at the sight of, of Allah Azza wa Jal. Your kinship, your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your uncles and aunts, you must connect to them to the best of your ability. So if you're in a foreign country and you can't see them, SMS them, uh, call them every now and then, use Skype, whatever means possible. If you're there, then occasionally a visit of a couple of minutes just to break the ice and leave before they get the chance to harm you or abuse you or say what uh, angers you is good, but you should not cut their, uh, your kinship. Firdosa says, uh, Taraweeh, is it 11 or 21? The Prophet والسلام, used to pray either 11 or 13, as per the hadith of Mother Aisha and Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them. Yet he never restricted that. And you have to be careful. If someone tells you how many times did the Prophet والسلام, perform Hajj, you'd say once. So if someone says, in this case, you must not perform more than one hajj in your lifetime. Otherwise, you would be innovating. This is nonsense. The Prophet encouraged us to perform hajj, وسلم, as much as possible. And he also encouraged us to pray night prayer without giving us any limitation. And therefore, if you pray 11, this is good. If you increase that to uh, 23, there is no problem. If you increase it to more than that, then they have, you have no problem at all with this, inshallah. We have a few remaining questions. I will address them tomorrow, inshallah. And until then, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sings of a